Welcome back. Last time, I tried to prepare you for a career as a car priest, capable of reciting the voice offering for the deceased. To make sure you'd pass your certification test, I gave you a variation of the Hotep de Nassau to translate. Let's see how you did. Okay, the first four hieroglyphs are easy. May the king give an offering. The question is, to whom are the offerings being made? Last time, it was Osiris, but not this time. It's going to be a god, probably associated with the dead. Let's sound it out. I-N-P, inip, inip. The determinative will help us. It's a jackal. So the god is Anubis, Anubis. The Egyptians called him Anupu or Anup, but the Greeks added their I-S ending, changed the P to a B, giving us Anubis. Anubis was a jackal-headed god of embalming, so it makes sense that mortuary offerings would be made to him. People often see a jackal painted on a tomb wall and assume it must be Anubis. Well, it ain't necessarily so. There were several jackal gods associated with mummification and the next world. There was Wepwawet, the opener of the way. Wep, the horns biliteral, means open, and Wat is our word for road. So Wepwawet was the opener of the road. He led the deceased to the next world. Another jackal god associated with mummification was Duamatef. The star is our dua, D-U-A, triliteral. The vulture is mut, and the viper is the F, duamatef. Since the star means worship and the vulture is mother, we might translate his name as his mother prays. Duamatef was one of the four sons of Horus who protected the internal organs of the deceased after they were removed during mummification. I think the reason all three jackals were associated with mummification is that the digestive system of a jackal lacks some of the enzymes for digesting fresh protein. Thus, they prefer decayed meat. For this reason, jackals prowled cemeteries and thus became associated with death. The largest cemetery in Egypt, Saqqara, is named after the jackal god, Sokar. But we can be sure that the jackal in our prayer is Anubis because his name is spelled out. So the king is making an offering to Anubis. What's next? Yes, he is the great god, Necha'a. We've seen that before. Now comes an epithet we haven't seen before. Our first hieroglyph is the head in profile. It's pronounced tep. It usually means first or foremost, like the head of a line. It can also mean upon. I think because the face hieroglyph meant that by association with the head came first to have that meaning. Next, we have the hieroglyph for mountain, ju, followed by the viper suffix pronoun. So the epithet means something like he who is on his mountain. This is a common title for Anubis, as is he who is in his tent. Both epithets have to do with the practicality of mummification. Because of the smells involved with working on a dead body, mummification took place out of doors, on a hill so the breezes could take the smells away. That's the mountain. Again, because mummification took place out of doors, a mummification tent was used, not a permanent building. Again, for the circulation of air. Okay, onward with our translation. We have seen the house and the oar before. They mean voice offering. Good. Next we have to him, an F. So a voice offering is made to him, meaning Anubis. Last time we saw the word for voice offering, there was a cluster of four hieroglyphs. We had the bread and beer on either side of the oar. This time, the bread and beer are separate hieroglyphs that follow the house and oar. Like I said, you have to be flexible. It's still a voice offering of bread and beer. 
Next, we have an owl, who could mean almost anything. In, from, of. Let's see what follows it. Re neb. The neb is all or every, and the sun means either the sun or day. Given that we have every, it'll mean every day. So the owl means something like in every day or at every day. We can really leave it out and just say every day. So the hope is that the king will grant offerings to Anubis, the great god, he who is foremost on his hill. May he give a voice offering to him every day. Now what do we have? Yes, we've seen it. For the Ka of. And now we expect a name. And we have one. Sound it out. Heka. Then the water sign and the branch are Nacht. With extra phonetic complements following. Heka Nacht. Heka Nacht. The determinative of the god with a flail is often used to determine the names of the deceased. The prayer ends with the traditional maharu, truer voice. You will see this offering prayer throughout Egyptian history. And as I said, it remained pretty much unchanged for 3,000 years. It's remarkable, but there's a parallel. In the Jewish religion, there's a prayer for the dead, the Kaddish. That also has been said unchanged for thousands of years. Before I can certify you as Ka priests, we should visit a chapel where the prayers were in fact said, both to see if you like the workplace and to look at some hieroglyphs. You can visit this chapel without going to Egypt. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. During the Old Kingdom, the offering of prayers was done in the chapel room inside the mastaba. The central feature of these chapels was what Egyptologists call the false door. This was a stone door that was a portal between this world and the next, through which the soul of the deceased could pass. It was in front of this door that the Hotep Din Nisu was recited. The Metropolitan Museum of Art has a complete mastaba at the entrance to its Egyptian galleries. And I bet you're wondering how they got it. <laughs> well, it was obtained fair and square. They bought it from the Egyptian government in 1913. Those were the good old days when the government was selling excess antiquities. There was once a special room in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo where tourists could buy all sorts of antiquities, even mummies. The mastaba the museum bought belonged to an official of the 5th dynasty named Perneb. The name is interesting. I bet you can hear two words that make up his name. The per is our word for house, but it could also mean go forth, like per em haru, the going forth by day, which is the real name of the Book of the Dead. The second word in his name, the neb, could be all or it could be lord. Since it's in a name, it's almost certainly going to be lord. This is how he wrote his name. Since the per is first, it's probably the verb to go forth, even though it doesn't have the little feet determinative. So his name means the Lord goes forth. Sometimes, as you'll see, he wrote it with phonetic compliments. Perneb built his mastaba at Saqqara, the preferred cemetery for the elites of the Old Kingdom. These officials had a variety of titles. Most common was this one. It was pronounced MR or something like MER, and it means overseer. It literally means in the mouth. <laughs> and I think this derives from the idea that the overseer is the guy who gives the orders with his mouth. This title of overseer is generic. It doesn't really tell us specifically what the person did. He's just an overseer. Consequently, it's usually followed by the specific job description. Take this for example. What do you think it means? Yes, overseer of the work. How about this one? What title would that be? 
Yes, overseer of the scribes of Ptah. It was a big deal to be a palace official, and our man Perneb was one of the highest. If you worked in the palace, you could put this on your tomb wall. We know these two words, king and no. So if you worked in the palace, you could say you were known by the king. A more elevated title was this one. Again, we have king, but the next word is new. We can see the mer chiseled biliteral, as in Narmer's name, with the S in front of it. It was pronounced semer, and it means companion. So if you had this title, king's companion, it was more than just working in the palace. You really had dealings with the king and were a high official. There could be any number of officials with this title, but Per Neb had something even higher. The hieroglyph that looks like a gear shift is a harpoon with a rope attached. It was pronounced weh, and it means one. When combined with companion, it means king's sole companion. This is as close to the king as a servant can get, and probably means royal valet. Per Neb was responsible for robing the pharaoh, making sure his meals were to his liking, and just about anything else the king wanted. For his tomb, Perneb chose a site just outside the enclosure wall of King Zasa's step pyramid. By Perneb's time, the step pyramid was already centuries old, a venerated monument, and Perneb wanted to be associated with its glory. His mastaba was built out of more than a thousand fine white limestone blocks. So after the purchase was completed, the Metropolitan sent its team of archaeologists to Saqqara to photograph, dismantle, and ship the monument to New York. It was a massive project with constant camel caravans bringing packing supplies from Cairo and returning during the night with the crated blocks. Whenever a temple, tomb, or chapel is dismantled, it's a learning opportunity. For the first time in thousands of years, all six sides of each block will be seen. Often, the hidden surfaces reveal instructions written at the quarry to make sure the blocks are delivered to the right building site. Sometimes there are mason's marks indicating the positioning of the block. So when the Metropolitan moved Per Neb's Mastaba, a great deal was learned about construction in the Old Kingdom. An extra bonus was that the tomb was not completed at Per Neb's death. So we can see different stages of how the chapel was decorated. Anyway, Let's go to Perneb's Mastaba, stand where the Ka priest did 4,000 years ago, and perhaps say a Hotep Dinasu for old Perneb. This is the false door in the main chamber of the chapel. There's Perneb, four times, twice on each side. He's in his official garb. He's wearing his starched kilt, a sign of high rank. You couldn't do much manual labor in that thing. It's kind of like our business suits today. In his hand, he has a staff of authority. Above his head, hieroglyphs give his titles. Let's look at the one on the right. Now, don't panic because it's the real thing. I get this from my students all the time when I take them to Egypt on a study tour. They've had four terms of Middle Egyptian and can translate fairly well. But standing in front of a temple wall, they're like deer in headlights. It doesn't look like the printed texts they're used to. I have to get them started by asking the simple question, does it read from right to left or left to right? So what about your text? Yes, left to right. Okay, we start with the left column. First word? Yes, Imachi, the venerated one. He's dead. Next word, that looks familiar. Yes, king. Next, we have the title. Sole companion. He's the king's valet. Good. Now, on to the column on the right. Imachi again. Then we see Necher Ah, the great god. This is Per Neb. It's okay, he's dead. Then his name, Per Neb. See, you really can translate. 
Now, let's look at the doorway. See that rounded thing at the top? It's a rolled up reed mat that could be lowered in the doorway of a house to keep the sand and dust out. Here in a chapel, a house of eternity, it's only symbolic, carved in stone forever. Now, let's see what we can make out on the lintel above the roller. Right to left or left to right? Yes, right to left. What kind of text is it? Yes, with a quick glance, you can tell it's a Hotep Dinesu. May the king give an offering. Good. To whom? Yes, Osiris. Of what? First, we have a voice offering. That's the house and the or hieroglyphs. Next, the water sign N of, yes, no owl, but we're flexible. Of what? There's our bread and beer. It's a standard formula. May the king grant an offering to Osiris. May he give a voice offering of bread and beer. Above it is Perneb, seated in front of an offering table piled high with ritual breads. But look beneath the table, by his legs. See all those lotus hieroglyphs? The symbol for a thousand? Look around the lotuses. There's geese, cattle, bread. That's the thousands of offerings that Perneb will receive. But let's look at the column on the right of the lintel. It's another Hotep de Nisu. This time to Anubis. Perneb isn't taking any chances. He's covering all his bases. Now look at Perneb on the right wall. He's wearing a leopard skin, the sign of a high priest. So among all his titles, he's also a priest. In front of his knee, there's the thousands of geese, cattle, and bread again. And on the table, we have the ritual bread. Above the ritual bread is a large rectangle divided into smaller sections. This has been called the menu card. Each small rectangle lists an offering for Perneb. Perneb's false door may help us solve a mystery that puzzled Egyptologists for more than a century. What is the function of the two mysterious air shafts in the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid? On two opposite walls of the king's chamber, at a gentle angle to two rectangular shafts approximately 9 by 8 inches, begin their journey through the body of the pyramid, continuing all the way to the exterior. These shafts have been known for centuries, but their purpose has not. It's been speculated that they were constructed to provide air to the workers as they labored deep inside the pyramid. This is nonsense. Such small shafts with no way to circulate air could not possibly have done any good. The clue to their purpose may be a second set of similar air shafts inside the queen's chamber. The queen's chamber is not really the queen's chamber. The king's chamber, right in the middle of the pyramid, was intended for Hufu's final resting place. But what if the king died before the pyramid was completed? What if the pyramid hadn't reached that height yet? The queen's chamber was Hufu's plan B. Much closer to ground level, it could have been used if the pharaoh died near the beginning of the pyramid's construction. It's in this room that two more air shafts were discovered in 1872 by Wayman Dixon, a young engineer sent to Egypt to build a bridge across the Nile near Giza. While setting up the bridge project, Dixon met Dr. James Grant, a Scottish physician living in Egypt. Grant had been asked by Piazzi Smythe, Scotland's Astronomer Royal, to obtain measurements inside the Great Pyramid for Smythe's survey of the pyramid. Grant asked Dixon if he would be willing to assist in the survey. Dixon was thrilled to be involved. Before beginning his survey, Dixon visited the pyramid several times, exploring its various chambers and passages. On one occasion, while he was there with Dr. Grant and Bill Grundy, a workman from the Nile Bridge Works, he made a discovery that would bring him immortality. Actually, it was Dr. Grant who noticed a crack in the stone in the Queen's chamber, pushed a wire into it, and watched it disappear. Hidden behind the wall was a deep recess of some sort. But what? Without hesitation, Grundy set to work with hammer and chisel on the wall to find the recess. This was the Wild West of Egyptology. There were few guards at the monument, 
and wealthy foreigners were often permitted to excavate. So the three men didn't even think of asking for permission before they started hacking away at the walls inside the Great Pyramid. The three men's investigation, or vandalism, yielded remarkable results. Now, as Bill Grundy's chisel penetrated the limestone wall, the trio discovered a shaft inside the Queen's Chamber. Dixon knew that the King's Chamber had two shafts, so they set to work on the opposite wall and it quickly revealed a second channel. The two 9 by 8 inch channels held three curious objects. A copper two-pronged hook with part of its wood handle still attached, a small granite ball, and a short length of wood, probably a measuring stick. The hook and ball can be seen today in the British Museum, but the stick's been lost. Dixon discovered the shafts, but never figured out their purpose or why they went there. He set fires inside the shaft to see if smoke exited on the outside of the pyramid. It didn't. And to this day, we don't know where the shafts in the Queen's Chamber end. Recently, two expeditions sent robotic cameras up the shafts only to be stopped by what appeared to be miniature limestone doors. This is where Pernev's false door may supply the answer to the air shaft's purpose. Pernev's chapel and false door were directly above the shaft that led down to his burial chamber. The idea was that the Ba could leave the body, fly up the shaft, and exit through the false door. Before the robotic camera went up the shaft in the Queen's chamber and discovered the door, I often wondered what happened to the Ba's of the pharaohs of the Old Kingdom. Their offerings were made in separate mortuary temples outside their pyramids, far from their mummies. How did the Ba's get out of the mummies and out of the pyramids? I think the purpose of the air shafts was to give Khufu's Ba access to the world of the living. That's why when the Queen's Chamber was being built, they put in the shafts. There was even a little symbolic door. But Khufu's Ba never used these shafts. Remember, the Queen's Chamber was only Plan B. Later, when the pyramid had reached the height of Khufu's burial chamber, Khufu was alive and well, so he wasn't going to be buried in the Queen's Chamber. They had to put in a second set of shafts for the King's Chamber, so they would be close to where the mummy was going to be placed. So false doors were really a big deal. If you could afford it, you just had to have one. Let me show you another false door that's in the Metropolitan Museum. It's of a contemporary of Perneb, and there he is, sitting on his chair. If we look closely at the rolled up reed mat above the door, we should find his name. That's the usual place. Well, does it read from right to left or left to right? Yes, right to left. It looks like something like Mechechi. These are hieroglyphs that are beautiful. Look at the owl. You can see his feathers. Look at the square panel above the lintel. There's Mechechi, seated in front of an offering table, piled high with the ritual bread. Now, look at what is all around the table. Offerings, each preceded by the hieroglyph for a thousand. This too reads from right to left, so we can see that Machechi will have a thousand cones of incense, a thousand cattle, a thousand geese, a thousand alabaster jars of oil, a thousand articles of clothing. In front of the table are two more offerings. We can clearly make out the lotus hieroglyph for a thousand, but the two offerings are not so clear. But with our experience, we can figure it out. The bottom one is a jar, so it's probably beer. That almost certainly makes the top one bread, and it does look like a pita. So it's bread and beer. At the bottom, on a low table, are two ewers, undoubtedly filled with cool water for the next world. If you look closely at the recesses, to the left and right, you can see the various jars that will hold all the offerings. Now, let's look at the lintel spanning the doorway. Right to left, yes? Okay. What kind of inscription is it? Yes. Even though the beginning is damaged, we can see that it's a Hotep Dinesu. So, 
to which God is the king making an offering? We clearly have a jackal, so it's probably Anubis. But it could also be Wepwat, the opener of the way. After Anubis, we have an extra D, give, hieroglyph. Here, I think it could mean cause. It's followed by a word we don't know, but let's see what we can figure out. Where does the word begin and end? Yes, it starts with the placenta and ends with the feet determinative. The feet determinative tells us that the word chep, there's a P after the placenta, tells us that it's got something to do with walking. And that's exactly what chep means, to walk. So Anubis might cause that he, see the horn viper, meaning the deceased, might walk. Then we have the face hieroglyph, which means a pawn in this case. Because of what follows it, what is the next word? What are those three hieroglyphs stacked up? Yes, it's the word for road, so it's plural, roads. So the hope is that Anubis, or perhaps Wepwawet, will cause the deceased to walk upon roads. What kind of roads? Well, we see the Nefer sign, so it's good or beautiful roads. And notice that Nefer has a T beneath it. Why? Yes, because the word for road, what, is feminine. Next, the N is probably to. To where? Well, the next hieroglyph is a variant of a place that we have had in the vocabulary recently. What does it look most like? The West. Instead of the feather, we have Horus on a standard, and the T is because Ament, the West, is feminine. Then we have the deceased name, Machechi. So the hope for this Hotep de Nisu is that the king will grant offerings to Anubis or Webwawet so that Machechi will be able to walk upon the beautiful paths to the West. Let's look at one more false door from the Old Kingdom, just for practice, before I certify you as a licensed car priest. This one looks a little different because it still has some of the original color. Look at the rolled reed mat over the door. It's not painted like a mat. It's pink. And so is much of the false door. The idea was to make the door look even more expensive than it was. The false door is made out of limestone, white limestone. But it's painted to look like an even more expensive pink granite. It's like modern decorators using faux marble. This is faux granite. Let's look at the owner's name. First, we have his title, known to the king. And there's his name, Ka M. And then we have a sign we're not familiar with. It's an arrowhead, and it's the SN biliteral, Sen. The word Sen means brother. We have three arrowheads, which looks like a plural, which would have been pronounced Senu. That's why, after the three arrowheads, we have the Nupat and its phonetic complement, Quail Chick. So his name is Ka M Senu, Soul of the Brothers. That's one possible meaning. If you look just below the lintel, you will see one of his many titles. See the M-E-R, the owl in the mouth? He's an overseer. But of what? The next hieroglyph tells you. It's the ideogram for granary. He's the overseer of the granary. Now let's just look at a small section at the bottom of the false door to see what we can figure out. Well, we see Hemnetcher. Priest. Next is our word for king. Then we have the word for purification, wab. Our last word is a bit damaged, but we can figure it out. Let's go a letter at a time. First letter. Yes, P. Next, beneath it, it's a broken loaf, T. It's the junction of two blocks, and that's why it's fragmentary. In ancient times, the join was filled with plaster, and the rest of the T was carved into the plaster. When it was all painted, you couldn't see the difference. Over the centuries, the plaster has fallen out. Okay, we have PT. What's our last letter? Yes, it's a twisted flax H. Pata. It's Pata. Cha M. Senu was also a priest of Pata, specifically a Wab priest. Space was limited, so they didn't write Wab priest with the man determinative as it should be. We have the word king 
to make sure that you know he was also associated with the king. So you look to the right of Ptah, and we see another familiar word, imachiyu, venerated ones. So if you were an archaeologist and found just this block, you would know it came from a mortuary monument of a Wab priest of Ptah, who was also a member of the court. These inscriptions provide us with insight into ancient Egypt's belief in the afterdeath. They show what they thought, what it would be like, and also how they thought they could achieve it. But it's not just the inscriptions on the walls that provide information. What the ancient Egyptian placed in his tomb is just as important. He believed that you literally could take it with you. So they packed their tombs with clothes, furniture, blankets, tools, just about everything you could think of. Next time, we will translate some magical objects and hieroglyphs in the tomb of Tutankhamun. I'll see you next time.